Okay, I see the numbers are good. Uh, we are already over 100 uh, participants, so I, I suggest that we we can kick it off. Uh, once again, we're very privileged to have Dr. Charles Cabeto with us once again. Dr. Cabeto is uh, a consultant and is a zoologist who wears many, 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 many hats. Uh, apart from being a teacher, a uh, manager, uh, among other things, he he has a, a very interesting topic today. And I guess he's, he's really in a very good place to tell us about uh, today's topic, which is entitled uh, Setting Standards of Care to Achieve Quality Universal Health Care. I guess for all of us, uh, especially in Kenya, universal uh, healthcare has been a buzzword for quite some time although our, our buzzwords keep changing depending on the political hit, but uh, it's, it's been there. We did, the, we did a bit of a piloting. Uh, I'm not sure what the outcomes were or rather what the challenges were, but I guess we'll hear a little bit, maybe more of that as we uh, get right into it. So Dr. Charles Cabeto is also a lecturer at the Jomo Kenyatta uh, University and he's going to take us through this topic today. Dr. Kabeto, you're ready? We can see yes. your screen. Yeah. You can Are see you... my screen? Yep. Okay. Good evening, all of us. <laughs> now, my, I'm happy to present to you the standards that can be set for universal health care or coverage. Now, my outline will be as follows, I talk a bit about universal health coverage. I work with Operation Smile. I'll tell you quite a bit about uh, what we do and how we have been able to set standards with OpSmile. Then you define some uh, parameters like uh, what is quality of care, what is a standard of care. Then we we'll just review a few of the KSC guidelines that we have been able to set. And then we're going to go into details on the current that we revised last year. And then the big question is, are we able to do the same for universal health care? Now, universal health care means that all individuals and communities can receive health care without suffering financial hardship. And stage was set in 1946 when the WHO did their the constitution whereby the health as a, not just necessary absence of disease, infirmity, but is total uh, health of a patient. And then our constitution of 2010 again set the stage for us, whereby the right of health, we promised Kenyans and citizens that we, they can be able to enjoy health of the highest attainable standard. Now, what has been happening? Half of world's population currently lacks essential health services. We are currently 7 billion or 7.8 billion, and you can imagine half of that cannot be able to access. A hundred million of uh, the population is usually pushed to poverty because of health expenditure. This is out of pocket payments the health care that we give to our relatives and our friends. It is also known that 5 billion people do not have access to safe, affordable surgical and anesthesia care. And this is worst in the middle and low income countries like sub-Saharan country and some Asian countries. And this was the basis for global surgery that was started and we are aware of from 2014 to try and see like whether they can be able to address access for safe anesthesia and surgery. And we know most countries now are formulating what we are calling national surgical obstetrics, trauma and the anesthesia services so that at least they can be incorporated for the services they need to deliver. About 143 million additional surgical services or procedures are required in the low and mid income countries each year to save life and also to prevent disability. And this has been done through the Lancet 
a global survey of 2030. Now, in then year 2015, 193 uh, United Nations members signed a document which is supposed to be for sustained development component. You remember initially we had the, the, the global um, issues with HIV infection and uh, the like, and maternal reduction of maternal health and I mean maternal mortality and pediatric mortality. Now, for the next uh, years, we're supposed to be having a safer, fairer, and healthier world. And universal health uh, uh, coverage was uh, actually coined and put in as a uh, the third of sustainable so the universal health uh, coverage is designed to give you preventive promotion treatment rehabilitation and palliative care again these are basics that we all know about when we are delivering health and it has become the policy priority for both the national government and also at the global level what are the advantages of universal health coverage one of the advantage that has been found is that you lower the cost because you are giving uh, you are covering a whole region of people you are using a designed uh, you have a designed way of delivering the service and therefore the health the cost of health becomes lower the other thing is that you reduce administrative costs you remove competition and you also create a healthier workforce because you are giving them standards, you are able to unify the amount of care or the type of care you are giving to your patients. The disadvantages is that for those uh, communities that have adopted universal health care, those who have or who are not sick pay for those ones who are going to get sick. So you find that there are people who are going to be paying for services they are not receiving or they will never receive in their life if they don't become sick. The other thing is that people now shift the burden of health and care from themselves into the system. Whereas people are able to take uh, insurances, once they know there is universal health coverage, they stop now taking their insurances, hoping that the government is going to do everything for them. <clears throat> you end up with compromised accuracy of care. And in most areas, you find that there are long waiting times because everybody wants to be treated either affordably or cheaply because people actually um, mistake universal health coverage to be free service. And therefore, they are all going to be waiting to be treated in the uh, institutions where UHC is provided. You find that even the payment to doctors and providers is limited because with universal health coverage, there is a uniform way of delivering service and paying and compensating the providers. Again, because we are looking at a whole region of like Kenya for 47 million Kenyans, you cannot be able to cope with the new technologies that are coming in because of the cost of buying equipment. And you require a genius to be able to do budgeting. Because as we are going to see that most of our issues have to do with budgeting and the raw allocation of funds that are provided by the national budget. And at the end of the day, you end up by limiting the services you can be able to offer to people just because you want to cover everybody with health care. Now, universal health care was launched in this December uh, 2018 by the president. He actually did it in Kisum, in the Jaramogi Odiga Teaching and uh, Referral Hospital. And only four counties were put in the pilot. There are supposed to have been a report made last year. I don't know whether any of us have been able to see the report to see what has happened in terms of the piloting of the universal health care. The other 43 counties are still waiting for it to be launched so that they can benefit. 
So since 19, uh, I mean 2015, when it was launched by the United Nations, we took three years to do it in Kenya. We are in 2010, and we don't know how long it will take for it to be rolled to the rest of the country and the counties. The challenges that we are facing with uh, this coverage, universal coverage, one is the budgetary allocation. We find that last year, the year that, that ended 2018, 2019, only 4% of the national budget was allocated for health. And out of these, which is about 60%, I mean 60 billion, what is recommended by the Abuja, Abuja, not Abuja, Abuja declaration was 15%. So 60 billion compared to about uh, four times that of what we, we are supposed to have gotten cannot be able to manage universal health care or coverage. And what happened to the facilities that were piloted, 30% was given to health facilities and 70% was uh, channeled to KEMSA. I, I don't want us to dwell too much on the stories of KEMSA and how it has affected the commodities, supplies, and uh, the way they have been dealing with the county hospitals. But you can imagine if you are given 70% of what is supposed to take care of universal health care and you are giving it to commodities and only 30% is going to facilities, it can tell you a lot on the way of thinking of the people who started the pilot. The other challenge has been weak health systems, high poverty levels, rampant corruption, and uh, we are still waiting for a report for, for cancer. They, 21 days are nearly over. It, it is so difficult to reach the vulnerable population. And those of us who come from countries like uh, UK, where there is uh, at least a health uh, welfare, where actually ambulances are sent to look for patients to come for elective uh, outpatient clinics. For us in the country, even reaching the vulnerable population for them to be able to access healthcare is still a problem and a challenge. The other one has been uh, selecting right packages whereby people can be able to benefit. Whether if you want to do a cesarean section, how do you package it so that you can be able to pay your workers, to pay the patients, to pay the hospital, so that it can be able to sustain the services. And the other problem has been integration of the informal sector. We know our population, the population that is employed in the country is so low, is about 4%. The rest of the population is in informal employment. And getting these people so that they can be registered and they can be able to benefit from the universal health care, uh, coverage has become a very big challenge. Now, so, so those are the issues with the problems we have had with universal uh, health coverage for the country. So if we come now to standards, how do we define a standard? A standard is a repeated, harmonized, and agreed and documented way of doing things or doing something. And I remember uh, when Kenyatta was being uh, proposed to be ISO certified, we developed very many SOPs. Now, you find that most of those SOPs are in a document. You go to a sister's office, that is where you get the documents, or you go to administrator's office, that is where you are going to get most of the SOPs have been piled and kept there, mainly for auditing, when external auditors or internal auditors come to audit the services that we do. But has that interpreted into giving a quality care? Clinical standards define the way we deliver appropriate care. They allow us to reduce unwarranted variation you can create standards that can be able to define and uh, identify care of specific conditions. Like, uh, let's say, how do we do regional analgesia and how can this be done and replicated in centers other than uh, referral hospitals? It is based on current best evidence. 
so so you don't just just pick uh, packages you don't just pick standards but you have to go to books you have to go to practices you have to go to journals and you have to do a lot of research to be able to know what is the current so that you can be able to create a clinical standard that has current evidence it is also supposed to give a person centered care and support we we are not working in a vacuum when a patient comes you need to take a patient in totality and know that this patient is different patient a is different from patient b the condition patient a is having is not the same as patient f is having and therefore that personal uh, consideration is important and then it has to ensure effective and safe services you don't just want to be wasteful you don't want to be having a patient coming for repeated uh, care you want to make sure that the patient will get timely and effective care now quality of care healthcare is defined or has three uh, i mean several um, parameters one is it has to be safe and and when you are trying to look for what we can use as a calling for uh, Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists, we chose safety as one of the ways of our mantra. It has to be timely, it has to be effective, it has to be efficient, it has to be equitable. Equitable meaning uh, all regions in the, the who or people who are getting uh, healthcare have, uh, should not be segregated because of their religion, because of their age, because of where they come from they should be able to get equitable care, which is equivalent, I mean, not equivalent to uh, equating or giving equal, but equitable means you have to consider globally that the people are getting the same type of care. And as we had said, it has to be patient-centered. We are not working in a vacuum, we are working to take care of patients. And standard of care is reasonable degree of service that a person should provide to another be it professional or medical so even when you are looking at this uh, universal health care are we giving a good standard of care that you yourself you would like to receive now some of the bodies that have been put in so that they can be able to regulate and see whether we have standards are listed as I have put there. We have the clinical uh, council of uh, clinical officers council. We have the medical laboratories and technician and um, technicians and technologies board. We have the medical practitioners and dentist council, all the way up the radiation protection board. And these regulatory bodies have been set in such a way that they are professional societies, the professional people are able to come up with the standards which they agree with the council, which can be used now to check, are they doing the right thing or are they not doing the right thing? And the most unfortunate bit is that we, most of us are never consulted when most of these standards are being made or these regulatory bodies are being um, empowered to look into what we do. They only come into play when there's a dispute between you and the citizens. That's when you find the medical, the practitioners and dentists go looking for you, telling you you didn't do, or there was a, you didn't act according to the set standards. And there are times we had, the, we used to ask them, what are these set standards? And we realized that theory, other than saying and asking what are these set standards, nobody has been able to set standards that can be used so that they can be able to regulate the practice we have in the country. Some have tried, but still, because we don't have the medical body, the way we, we are trying to see whether we, a, 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 an act of parliament can be able to give us a medical body that can be able to look into the human resource development and even the regulation of health management in the country. We are still having these jointed activities between us and the practitioners and the citizens. Now, 
when I was looking at literature to get, do we have any quality uh, standards that have been set by the government and the Ministry of Health? I came across the Kenya uh, quality model that was uh, structured and uh, was uh, developed in the year 2001. It was supposed to have integrated evidence-based medicine with public health standards, clinical standards, and patient partnership, creating the what they were calling then the KQM. But unfortunately, again, these were documents that were put in, uh, in the Ministry of Health, and it was never rolled out until somebody thought we need to review, see what was happening to the KQM in the year 2009, it was reviewed and they came up with a, a newer name because every time you renew, uh, you review something, you also want to come with a newer name to impress the donors that at least you have done something. So it was changed to Kenya Quality Model of Health, KQMH. Again, what it did is set in clinical management uh, standards management uh, support and readership. And I know most of us from 2009 up to about 2012, very many senior doctors were taken for leadership courses so that they could be able to roll out the quality model. But when it came to Im implementation, which again was a pilot, it was not a global set. The approach that was used was the Zyber Kaizen approach. And again, those of us who know about the, the Kaizen approach, which uses the five S's that we are borrowed from the Japanese, it means that we are sorting, setting, shining, standardizing, and sustaining. And again, it could not be able to interpret into quality healthcare. What it helped was uh, allow people to change the way they were thinking in terms of their offices from a very haphazardly arranged offices into very smart offices. People were advised that you can apply the same in your house, you can apply the same in your personal life. But as far as we are concerned that the pilot that was done, we, we, we are not very sure whether it was able to improve on the quality of care of our patients other than improvement on documentation. And I remember we came, out with very many documents, very many ways of doing things. Uh, we could be assessed by external auditors in our offices, we are looking very clean. But whether it interpreted into those qualities now, I mean, uh, converting to good care of patients, we still have to see. And one of the challenges again of uh, implementing this was because of funding funding for the exercise itself, funding for health facilities, and the human resource even to do the training and even to do the implementation itself was a problem. Then management commitment was a problem because if there's nothing you are gaining from an exercise you are doing. We lacked uh, leadership facilitation and the infrastructure was also a problem, a very big challenge and most of the times, people were never involved. Involvement of citizens, wanting to tell them this is in the direction we are moving, move with us. Because if you don't get a buy-in from your citizens, it becomes a big, big problem for you to be able to implement whatever you want to implement. So just a bit of uh, what has been done by the society so that at least we can dive into the, the, the standards that we have been developed, the Operation SMILE, is that this year we have been able to have a standards or guidelines in terms of the COVID-19 management, both for operating room and the critical care unit. We have been able to set guidelines for development of a COVID ventilator. Because I remember what had happened is that everybody wanted to develop for us a a bag squeezer instead of a ventilator that could be able to help our patients. Then the others, uh, we have developed the ambulatory surgery patient assessment. We have a code of conduct, professional conduct, 
And in 2016, we are able at least to launch the national anesthesia guidelines, which touch on six factors or six areas. One of them was on the recommended minimum facilities for safe administration of anesthesia in operating suites and other anesthetizing locations. And we are looking at the principles of anesthesia care, staffing, anesthesia equipment, drugs, and the way we recover our patients is the PACU. All that is contained in the document. Actually, if you go to Anesthesia Kenya uh, uh, website, you'll be able to get the details. Those of us who never got the booklet. Unfortunately, I don't know whether we are practicing what we uh, determined to do in 2016, or there are just books that are lying, waiting for somebody now to come and revise and maybe call it now National Anesthesia standards. We also covered on uh, preoperative re review guidelines. We also did a bit on recommendations on uh, monitoring during anesthesia. And the only specific uh, disease that we picked or I mean uh, item that we picked of practice obstetrics anesthesia. And this we, are, we know it's because the, all of us, wherever we are, in the district, in the level three, level four, level five, level six, we always uh, encounter obstetric patients. And because of maternal mortality and morbidity, it was not that it was good to develop guidelines. Whether we are using them or not, we will be able to audit ourselves and see whether we are able to do it or not. And then we developed one on periandesthesia machine checklist. So that by the time you are, starting to anesthetize your patient, you should be able to know that your machine is proper, you have checked. So those are guidelines that were they developed by the Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists and uh, launched in 2016. And the question is, should, now, should we be able now to pull these and make them into standards? Now, we dive a bit on uh, operation smile because I wanted to use the operation smile model of development of standards for us to be able to see that it is possible to do and we have been able to do it. Operation smile is a non-profit global organization that is in over 50 middle and low income countries in Africa, Asia, South America and it has been in existence from, uh, for the last 38 years, offering uh, safe surgery, dental, speech therapy, nutrition, psychotherapy, and associated services. Now, these are just a, a representation of the way uh, we have evolved with Operation Smile. It's only that, yeah. My casa can be able, if you see the, the picture I'm showing this, we took in a crew during the 25 years anniversary of Operation Smile. The couple, uh, Bill McGee and uh, Kathy McGee, went to Philippines in 1982, just for a medical uh, outreach. And when they were leaving the site, they realized that they were not able to take care of uh, nearly 300 kids who had uh, cleft uh, lip and they promised to return. So they returned in 1982 with uh, a bunch of, uh, a, or a group of volunteers. They, they assembled donations, they went, they started operating and that is how they started the Operation Smile. For us, we started the Operation Smile mission in Kenya in 1987. Uh, and Professor Gumi was one of the founders of uh, Operation Smile. They worked with the couple, with the Bill and uh, Bill and uh, Kathy McGee, with uh, Dr. Nguti, who is a maxillofacial surgeon. That time I had just started uh, anesthesia as a senior registrar. I had just finished my postgraduate training. And from that day up to today, we have been able to join hands in uh, Operation Smile. So these are the activities. I, I, we do a lot of training in Rwanda. This is Dr. Chokwe. These are two students from uh, University of Rwanda Anesthesia. 
This is uh, one of the anesthetists who had come from Sweden. We do dental work. This is one of our dental volunteers. This was a mission in Meru. This is a surgeon assessing the patient. Uh, we have uh, uh, patients being entertained and being taken care of uh, by child uh, therapists to make sure they are comfortable and especially when they are coming to be to go to theater or they are being um, screened. These are teams, uh, this is a team uh, from Ghana. This gentleman is joining our operation smile in Kenya to join Roy so that they can be able to reactivate. And we want to start with Nakuru to see whether we can start our activities, which we stopped about um, five years ago because of many challenges that we were getting, especially getting patients who had pure um, cleft lips and parrots. This is a, a group, mainly local, although this was a mission we had in Meru. And then the way we develop the standards of care for Operation Smile is that we have got our chief medical uh, officer in uh, headquarters, he's called Ruben. He has done, uh, he's a medical doctor who has done MPH. We have uh, one of the directors in headquarters, she is a, a nurse who is now the director. And we have got a pediatrician who is the associate chief medical um, officer. Uh, this already works in the, uh, these two work in the headquarters supporting what we call the medical oversight. Then all the others are anesthetists representing regions in the country, in the world, global, the world. She, she takes care of China. We have a gentleman who takes care of South Africa, Mozambique, um, and uh, Congo. And then we have another one who takes care of Central America, another one who takes care of uh, South America. Then we have one who takes care of North Africa and Middle East. And, and, I, and I take care of the Sub-Saharan countries of uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Ghana, and Malawi. It, it is strange that they realize that it's only an anesthetists who can be able to become regional medical officers. And we, we are the ones who have been able to help in managing the medical situations. So this is a short journey of the way we started our global uh, standards development. On the upper part here is uh, between the year of 2006 and 2007, the medical oversight team met in uh, Norfolk, our headquarters, and we were able to come up with three standards. One looked at equipment, the other one looked at patients, and the other one looked at the team. And, and this is because we had had disasters in several countries. One of the disasters we had was in uh, Kenya, whereby we got anesthesia providers who had never used halodin before. So when they came and they started using halodin the way you might just open up to 8% of sevoflurin, we lost two of our patients. And this put people into thinking, if we are going to be able to be doing missions globally, how can we be able to standardize so that we can be able to have uniform um, care and safety? So they started with the equipment and they actually developed uh, anesthetic machines which were portable, which could be able to use only oxygen and halothane and we eliminated nitrous oxide completely. Then the other standard was selection of patients. How do we select patients and how do you deal with patients and how do we make our patients safe for anesthesia? Then it came to the team. Who are, who are we going to be using? How do you credential them? How do you know they are safe? And we looked at qualifications and distribution, and we are going to dig into it further. Then as a growing uh, organization in 2010, again, we met and the standards now increased to 14. Then 2014, again, we met the standards increased to 17. 
So we had 17 global standards of care. Then in 2019, again, we sat, we thought it is good to review our, um, our global standards. And after a whole year of deliberations, in October of last year, we met in Sweden and we were able to reduce the uh, the standards to seven, dealing with facility, staff, equipment, supplies, patient selection, patient management, safety of patients, and quality assurance. So this is the team that was uh, in uh, Sweden, drawn from all over the world so that we could be able to come up with standards that we can be able to use now for a few years before again we decide whether we are going to look into them in terms of view or not. Now, when we dive into our standards, the group of standard one looks at facility. And the statement says all facilities used for an operations my program should be verified safe and appropriate for the intended use. And when we are looking at facilities before we even set our feet to do a mission, we do what we call fact find. And fact find, we have documents that we have used, we have a format that we have used, and one of the formats is a anesthesia facilitation assessment tool that has been developed by the WFSA, the modified by Operation Smile, and we have borrowed a bit from the WHO so that we can be able to look at what are the requirements of a facility in terms of the theater facility, in terms of the health facility, the whole global hospital, in terms of what they have in uh, oxygen, the, whether they have um, backup generators. When you are dealing with patients and screening, do you have enough space so that you can be able to have enough movement? Surgical environment, do you have enough or adequate theater spaces? And uh, most of the things we compare with what we have in the National Hospital in Kenyatta. One theater of Kenyatta, you cannot compare it in a theater where you can only fit one operating table. We look at uh, patient lodging. What normally used to happen is that you would have patients traveling for a thousand kilometers and they cannot be accommodated in the hospital because of the limited um, bed, I mean, bed capacity of hospitals. So one of the challenges we had, and this was in Meru, we had transported patients to Gariza to come to Meru for operation, and we had to keep them for a week before screening throughout the week of uh, an, uh, surgery, and then one week after, so that we could be able to observe them before we send them back to Garissa. And unfortunately, we had not set standards for lodging for patients. And many patients got infected. We had conflict between different sexes because you have uh, children who had been brought in by their fathers, others had been brought in by their mothers, Others had been brought in by their guardians. Even the, because we had picked a school, even the amenities in terms of toilets. So now we have set standards for patient lodging that you have to have medical people visiting us the whole week that the student and patients are going to be there. You have to make sure that it has habitable or it is of habitable uh, uh, standards. The other one is volunteer accommodation. Again, we have had issues with uh, sharing of beds. I know it is a principle to share rooms, but when it comes to sharing of single beds, it becomes a very big issue. So these are things we have now decided. The fact fight team had to make sure that volunteer accommodation, people are volunteering their 10 days, they need to be comfortable. Is it a uh, mosquito invested uh, environment? How do you deal with, is it a noisy? Is, are, are you sleeping on top of a bar or a lodging? Is, that, uh, is the accommodation habitable? So the fact picture, this is one of the shelters and you can see there are so many patients have, have been uh, operated on, others have not been operated on. 
they have their guardians, so you cannot accommodate all these people in the hospital. So you have to look for an accommodation which is acceptable. This is the operating rooms. You need to inspect and see, can they be able to fit two operating tables? Because at the end of the day, you want to, you don't want to disadvantage the hosting hospital by taking all their operating rooms. You want to make sure that you can be able to utilize one room or two rooms and leave them to deal with their emergencies. Now, the growth of standard number two is looking at the team. And when we are looking at the team again, we want to make sure that we have a team that can be able to look into patient safety care, taking into the, the consideration that these are patients from different populations, they have different characteristics, and therefore when you are looking at the team members and the team composition, you have to be able to know how do you um, set your team. So one of the things that we do when we visit a site, when you are doing carrying a, a fact file is to know who are these team members? How many surgeons do we have? What are their capabilities? How many anesthesia providers? How many nurse, uh, uh, um, nurses do we have for pre-op, post-op? And you're going to find that we have a very big team. What are their qualifications? We, we aim at getting the highest qualification you can be able to get for a country. If they don't have, we have to import them. We have to bring them in. So long as you are running a, a mission, you have to make sure that the stuff you are bringing is also qualified enough for it to be associated with Operation Smile. You're also looking at who can be made into a team a leader and how can the staffing be. And this is a whole list of teams of our staff that we look for. You need a craft surgeon, anesthesiologist, operating nurses, a pre and post op, PACU nurses, a pediatrician, a PACU physician, a dentist, medical records, medical photographers, biomedical, speech therapists, all the way to nutritionists. And you also need a coordinator for all these. So if you don't have that set, you might end up with a team of three people and they're not going to be able to complement each other so that you can be able to provide safe anesthesia and safe surgery and have safe uh, outcome. Now, the medical global standard three is looking at equipment, supplies and pharmaceuticals. A and we know again, you go to some hospitals whereby you have broken equipment, you go to some hospitals where they don't have enough in terms of supplies, they don't have good systems management, uh, I mean, uh, supply chain management. Some bring in some uh, standard drugs. And we have to be careful when we are taking a mission. You have to be sure that whatever equipment you are going to use, medical consumables and medical medicine has been taken care of. Now, this is an example of what I, when I went to Philippines in the year 2001, we only had a cylinder of oxygen. You can see it is strapped on the wall. We had a vaporizer for halogen, and we had a monitor that was able to give us all the necessary NIBP, SpO2, respiratory rate, and ECG. And it was safe for that time. But currently now you have to look at advancement and look for equipment that can be able to give you safe anesthesia. This uh, cylinder can easily fall and cause a lot of damage. So for hospitals whereby they don't have enough equipment, we bring in consumables and we make sure that they are up to date in terms of expiry date and in terms of the sources. Standard uh, four, or is patient selection. And this we select our patients again through several processes because we want to make sure that patients are well optimized for surgery and related care. So that is the narrative, the, the, the statement, the way it is states. But we look at the screening. We used to realize that when we go for screening patients, we used to turn a lot of patients away. 
So currently now we are encouraging pre-screening a month, two months before uh, a mission comes in, a team of pediatrician, anesthetist, and a nurse, they go assessing and registering patients. And what they want to assess is nutrition and medical conditions that can be taken care of before the patients are brought for missions. And this has, mainly, this has reduced the number of us turning patients away. And it has also helped us to optimize patients and the patients we are getting for missions are healthy because you have taken care of their nutrition. Those ones who had cardiac issues, respiratory issues are first of all taken and optimized before they come for missions. Most of us who have been uh, with Operation Smile uh, having attended, we know of categories of patients. We used to have categories, five of them. Now they have increased to seven. And this is to do with prioritizing our cases. <clears throat> then we deal with patient selection and scheduling. Again, the patients you want to select are at least six months and above. And they should be having a hemoglobin of nine and above. And they should be not having malnutrition. Then we look at informed uh, consent whereby you take consent for examination, photography, surgery, and dental care. And it has to be informed consent, whereby the surgeon has to have an interpreter who is explaining to the guardians and to the patients if they are big enough. You don't want just to take patients to theater without informed consent, which covers examination, photography, surgery, and dental care. Then we also, look at surgical deviations. There are times that you find that you want to do a kid who is less than six months, but is healthy. And by the time maybe a mission is coming back, you realize that this child will either have become uh, too old or they are missing an opportunity. They have traveled from very far. Others is deviation in terms of the surgical procedure. You might have wanted to do a palate repair, but then you find the nose has a problem and you need to do nasoplasty. How do you do it? The other one is to do with deviation in time. Again, most of the surgeries we choose should not go beyond two hours. But you find a patient might take three hours because of the complexity of a bilateral cleft flip to palate. And you, since you might not be getting people to go to that site, in a hurry, you might think that this is something you might want to divide, deviate. And the other one is you find that you have many patients, you have a lot of personnel, but you had been set to do six tables, but you can be able to add a seventh table. What are the requirements that you need to do so that you can be able to do that? We call them surgical deviations. Then global standard number five deals with now the actual medical care of your patient. With from pre-admission, you can admit patients either from home, from uh, the shelter we had seen. You need to give patients uh, and their caregivers uh, education. And this deals with, most of them actually are worried. Were we bewitched? Or is this a curse? And you need to tell them the genealogy and the, the etiology of and genetics of a cleft lift and cleft palate. You need to tell them how the process you take. You need to tell them how they will take the care of their post-op care in terms of pain and in terms of wood care. So this is patient and caregiver education. Then when you admit them in the surgical wards, there is a process whereby you process them, you admit them, medical records and documentation is very important. The operative care, we take care of the fasting, examination, Again, you have to identify and uh, verify the identity of patients following photos. And you have to discuss with them again on the surgery, intended surgery, because most of the time the people who do review are not the same ones who come to do surgery. Patients are allocated tables and surgeons. Then when you are doing the surgical process, you have to do the 
the anesthetist and the surgeon have to pick the patient from where the patient is. You don't wait for somebody to bring the patient to theater. You are the one to go pick, verify this is the patient, talk to the relatives of the guardian and tell them we are the team that is taking your patient away. Then you have to do the safety checklist, pre and the induction, pre-cutting or pre-incision and then post before you take the patient to recovery. You have to take photos pre and post and you have to take all the issues you do for induction, interop management, analgesia, fluids and antibiotics, prophylactic, all this is covered in this standard. And then when you take your patient for post-op care, you have to deal with all the activities of the PACU. queue. The standard says the anesthetist and the circulating nurse have to accompany the patient to PACU, make sure that the patient is connected to the monitors, make sure that the anesthetist take the first reading before they hand over the patient. We also feel that we need to have at least a bed identified in the hospital, the host hospital. If there is no ICU bed, we have to have transport and way of transporting a patient who needs ICU care. And all those are, that is documented. And you also have to document how you discharge your patient and for ongoing care, how you deal with wound care, nutrition, and algesia, and how do you deal with complications. And we follow our patients the first one week, and that is seven days, and for six months, we have to set a team of surgeons and nurses and medical records and a photographer to be able to deal and see how far or how well your patient is doing. And these are some of the things we do to take care of our patients. We do a bit of training in TAOP. This is a, a demonstration of how we do zygo, the zygomatic uh, parenting nerve. This is uh, just one of the ways you deal with our patients in the recovery world. This is just a representation of recovery ward and how we assess our patients for pain. This is how we take our patient and train and teach during theater. And this is an adult pre and post photos, uh, some of the activities that we do in the total management of our patients. The sixth standard is on safety. And we have realized that if you just operate without looking at safety, you are actually endangering patients and you will not be meeting the mandate. So safety of medical practice is at the core of our standards when we are thinking about running a mission or running activities of Operation Smile. So one of the things we do is uh, emergency preparedness. We have to do a drill in the OR, the PACU, queue. We sometimes we combine the two and post up. We do a drill whereby we are able to know these are the emergency drugs, this is the emergency box, and this is how do we deal, and we allocate and apportion duties so that in case of any emergency, we know who is going to do what. The other safety is on blood, because we rarely give blood to our patients, but if it has to be given, we have to follow the regulations of blood transfusion in terms of documentations, in terms of the indications, and in terms of observation. Safety on medication, we have the eight uh, arras or the right to medicine. The right medicine, that is you make sure that you are giving the right medicine so two people have to check what you are giving. You have to make sure that you are giving the right to the right patient. We know we have given uh, medicine to the wrong patients previously, so this has to be made sure. We have dosages and we have formularies and we take weight and height of our patients so that you give the right dose. We, we do a lot of calculations. You have to know the timing. If it is three times in a day, if it is twice in a day or whatever, the right route so that you're not giving a normal medication, uh, you are giving it, um, I mean, not tomorrow, but a rectal medication, you are not giving it orally, or an intramuscular drug, you're not giving it IV. So the right reason for it, have you documented it? Has it been prescribed? And are you getting the proper effect? 
So these are safety measures. The other aspect we looked into safety is translation interpreters for the both the team, patient and caregiver. So we always make sure that we get the proper information by getting the right people. And medical students have been very helpful for us when we are working with them so that they can be able to do translators. And the team itself has to have both open and closed loop communication. And medical documentation is very important for safety. Medical records, the way we document our anesthetic charting and making sure that we observe confidentiality. We make sure that any document that we make, we take care of confidential issues. The last one is a standard is to do with quality. Again, even if you are talking of uh, standards that give quality, we had to specifically talk of quality because we realized again, if you are not looking at quality, we are not giving a good service for our patients. And this has got to do with patient safety, risk management, and transparent reporting. Now, one of the reporting we do are medical events. Medical events are, can be classified as red, that is there has been a cardiac arrest, or they can be green. Something might have happened that could have harmed a patient, but, but it didn't happen. We have what we call center and program reports whereby we say we had these team members, we did these types of operations, we did these numbers, we were having meetings every day. And then we have reports we make for surgical and patient outcomes. Then we do for quality medical review event. So if there is a mishap in an operation or an outcome, a medical peer team, is uh, put together so that you can be able to review all aspects, meaning for education, educating people, the same here we call the root cause analysis. Then from there, you can actually be able to do a peer review and you communicate with both the people who were involved, the center that was involved and the foundation. Then what we have what we call a quality site uh, visits uh, and these are, quality team that visits a site. They have a document of about uh, 10 pages that looks from pre-op. Actually, it looks from the, the, the way the hospital was identified, the way it was, the facility was, uh, the fact fight was done, all the way to post-op, six months. How has it gone? Has it adhered to the set standards or has it not? Then we look at infection control, which is very important. How do people take care of personal when they are scrubbing, when they are moving their attire? How do they dress? Do you walk from, uh, with the scrubs from home to theater? Do you change when you come to the operating room? Do you put on uh, the shoes that are sterile, I mean, or, or that are clean so that you don't bring infection from outside the operating room? So all these are infection control. Uh, and the last one is how do you deal with surgical site infection? Because again, surgical site infection is a proof of quality. If you get mo most of your patients getting infected, it means there's something amiss in the quality of the care you're giving, either in the skin preparation or in the, 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 the equipment you are using, all in the supplies of the things you use for cleaning your skin, disinfecting your skin and your instrument, or could it be because of the way you sterilize your equipment? It is a quality issue that has been documented. So this is just a, a form of a report that we have, or a report, an example of a medical report that we do. And it has the red, issues, cardiac death, cardiac arrest, all the way to incorrect patient. Uh, this has been uh, an issue. I don't think we have ever had the incorrect patient because we do a lot of checking in terms of pre and pre-operation and the way we label our patients. But we know it has happened in other environment where the wrong patient has been operated on. Then we have the amber bit. Again, they are taking places 
was it a position injury was it did you have a retained uh, throat pack which uh, and the patient uh, found themselves in the recovery ward with a retained uh, throat pack then we have the green bait which actually talks of things that happen bronchospasm laryngospasms and we are they taken care of an inability to intubate a patient is reportable but most likely the patient never went into any harm did the patient get a seizure or a conversion the patient came out of it and it needs to be reported not punitively but to make sure that we have a way of recording for quality uh, issues and then it will need a narrative of what happened a story of what has happened and then we will need the signatures of everybody who was involved all the team leaders the surgeon the anesthesiologist the coordinator and then it is sent either to the regional medical director and a copy sent to the headquarters so that this may, can now be analyzed and issues can be learned from this so now the big question is this is what we have been able to do for operation smile we have been able to look at the four s's that is space staff staff and systems and we have been able to come up with seven global standards of care touching on facility touching on equipment touching on the team adding up with quality of patients and the big question is can these be adapted for our universal health care and who is going to be the driver for this thank you very much it has taken quite a bit of time but at least uh, i thought it is good for us to share our operation smile um, experience for us to be able to know how we can move forward with our standards for giving quality uh, care to what we think can become a rolled out uh, universal health coverage thank you uh, thanks a lot dr kamito for that uh, very uh, exhaustive uh, discussion uh, we will i um, i'm in position of a few uh, a few questions uh, we will tackle them uh, a little bit later at this point i'd also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, the chief administrative uh, secretary for health uh, dr masi mangagi who joined us uh, at some point uh, i think she's still around karibu sana dr mangagi uh at this point i would like us to uh, go to give uh, our sponsors for today uh, pharma specialties a few minutes just to tell us about uh, who they are and uh, we want to really appreciate them and thank them for uh, taking the initiative to partner with us in today's uh, webinar uh, i would like to invite uh, wickliff rachonyo to tell us more about uh, these uh, products karibu rachonyo you can hear me i can hear you doctor how are you very fine thank you karibu sana Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. We thank uh, Dr. Kabetu for the presentation. In fact, UHC is something which is close to the hearts of Kenyans. Now, on behalf of Voma Specialities, we have Themis Medicare, which is our principal. And I know my colleagues are also online. We just wanted to talk about Dexem, Dexmeditomidine, uh, which is the only sedative analgesic and hypnotic, and alpha-2 receptor agonists. And uh, so Dexem, that is our brand, Dexmeditomidine, then which is given as a loading dose of one microgram per kg over 10 minutes, and also maintenance dose of 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 micrograms per kg per hour. Now, the beautiful part of DEX and dexmeditomidine, adequate sedation, cooperative sedation, where the patient is easily aroused even when under sedation. And also, since it uh, has analgesic sparing effect, minimal requirements of the opiates, and also does not cause respiratory depression and uh, also facilitate extubation, reduced stay on ventilator, 
and also overall hospital stay. Now this one's all of us, you agree doctors that most of the patients who are in the ICU are anxious and agitated. And Dexem has got anxiolytic properties. It manages anxiety and also ensures patient comfort. Because one, there is reduction of sympathetic of activity. And uh, two, the patient mimics natural sleep pattern. Used in both the ICU and also, also in procedural sedation. Prior to and during variety of surgical, medical and diagnostic procedures. And also suitable for patients who develop opiate tolerance. Now this is just a summary of some of the features. Cardiovascular stability, an aesthetic sparing effect, whereby the quantity of opiates given is reduced. And the patient can easily be aroused even when I say this one facilitates communication with healthcare providers and easily titratable. And one of the, also another key feature is that it facilitates winning of the patients from the vent. Uh, this is just a comparative about the efficacy versus the other sedatives which are in the which you use. You find one arousable sedation, cooperation, anxiolosis, analgesia, reduction of severing, and also does not cause respiratory depression. Now, Themis also, we have another product, Themiset, which is Palonocetron. Palonocetron, the second generation of the 5-HT3 receptors antagonists. Now, we have got the two strength, the 250 micrograms per 5 ml, which is for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and also the 1.5 ml which is for post-operative nausea and vomiting. Now, Themiset is used in the prevention of post-operative nausea and vomiting for up to 24 hours following surgery. And uh, the 250 for initial and repeated course of cancer or chemotherapy. The dosage adult dose the Themiset 75 or the Themiset 250 comes in already constituted form. You just give a single 1.5 ml per 75 micrograms over 10 seconds immediately before the induction of anesthesia. And safety and effectiveness patients below the age of 18 years have not been established in postoperative nausea and vomiting. Now, what makes Themiset? outstands the drugs in the same class, longer half-life of 40 hours. In essence, it's taking care of both the acute and the delayed phase of nausea and vomiting. So long acting. And then highest affinity for the 5H3 receptors and also strong binding to the 5H3 receptors. Better clinical response than the other, other cetrons and better safety profile. It has less side effects. So take home message on Themis at 75, long acting of 40 hours, given just 10 seconds before the induction, just immediately before the induction of anesthesia, but given over 10 seconds. When you want to manage nausea and vomiting, and you want to take care of both the acute and the delayed phase of nausea and vomiting, Themiset 75. Thank you so much. But now as I leave, we are in the last stages of uh, introducing this astracurium, which will be very much cost effective in the Kenyan market. And lastly, uh, one month ago, we introduced paracetamol injection, 
ours going by the name Paratech, which is in the uh, has been made in a model of uh, it's aquas based, hence less pain when it's being injected. And the beauty of it is that it's both for IV and IM combined. You can give it both I, IM or IV. Otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weekly, for that uh, uh, presentation. I think we we especially we especially appreciate your uh, partnership, and uh, I believe these are some of the products that we really use on a day-to-day -day basis, especially the Xmetobid. We really uh, partnered very well in this regard. At this point, uh, I, I'll go handle a few questions that have uh, been posted for uh, Dr. Kabetu. And uh, one of the questions that has been posted from someone by the name George Oguma uh, is uh, about uh, the healthcare delivery in Kenya uh, and the constant industrial actions by dissatisfied health workers, basically the human resource uh, dissatisfaction. And, and uh, the question is, how best can the problem of health workers strike be addressed in this country in the wake of the ambitious universal health care program? Dr. Kabetu, how would you respond to that? Ganya, that's a tough one from a woman. <laughs> it's a very political question and uh, being a non-politician. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if Dr. Mwangangi is there, we would uh, like her to respond to this, eh? if okay. she's still with us. But the only thing I can say is that when the, do, before the promulgation of our new constitution in 2010, the medical side of the health was forgotten because we thought somebody was going to talk for us. So we never went to the forefront the way the lawyers did, the way the teachers did the way the architects did. I think we are more concerned about our other issues of uh, beginning of life, abortion and other things that we lost and we were not able to get a health commission for us. And one of the issues that we have been seeing is that even when we look at health, it becomes very complicated because we are looking at everybody who wants to deal with health Health was devolved, and at the same time, we don't know whether the workers were also devolved or not. It is a very emotive and a very complicated um, question for me to be able to deal with. But I think being a political question is if we had a health council or if we had a health commission, would it be able to handle the human resource issues or would there still be issues with industrial? Because we know even with the um, Teacher Service Commission, we still have issues with the teachers and their union. So I don't know whether that is a solution or not, but when we think of people who have no in brackets, we don't know who owns the people who are in the uh, counties, those who are left in the central government, do we have issues? How do we channel our issues so that we can be comfortable in the way we deal and then you have to look at why are people going on strike is it the salary or is it the commodities because there are some things you might not be able to solve until you look at the root cause of why are our medical people healthcare human resource people having industrial some will complain of currently because of ppes the other time it is because of delayed salaries the other time is because of promotions. So, so you find that you may not be able to do, uh, I may not be able to give you a very comprehensive or even a way forward answer. And I think since we have our CAS, uh, who is also political, she can tell us how it can be sorted out and what her, her thoughts are. All right, thank you. Dr. Masi Mwangagi, are you still with us? Looks like she's she's not here. Oh, okay. 
Okay. The next question is about, uh, I think you also mentioned this, about uh, the, the, when it comes to the implementation, how do you uh, ensure equity? How do you ensure that, uh, let's say, uh, a pregnant mother in uh, Tana River gets same good or same quality of care to that mother in Kiambu or in uh, Machakos County? And uh, in this regard, who, who, who funds the... the the, the requisite, the necessary mechanisms to ensure equity. Now, e equity has been a very big problem because you have to look at infrastructure first. What, ha, 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 what impedes us from getting access to healthcare? Again, that is something we didn't touch, but one of the issues that have been uh, identified is that people have to be educated enough to be able to seek for medical care. So seeking patents is one of the issues have, that has been a problem and it has been a challenge. Once you have the knowledge of seeking, how do you access? So seeking is one problem. Accessing is another, and this could be due to road network. You are in an area whereby you only depend on a boat to move from one side of uh, your, your village to go and access healthcare. And people have been able to address this by using all means of transport. We have seen uh, people using donkey carts. We have seen others using wheelbarrow. We have seen others using uh, uh, motorbikes, ambulances. We, we have seen others using helicopters. So that equity of infrastructure, again, it has to do with more than we are looking at in terms of healthcare. So once you have accessed do you have enough facilities? Do you have enough commodities? Do you have enough um, human resources? And, and I'll tell you this, having been in administration for long, is that you find everybody finding their way into Kenyatta National Hospital. So they'll be able to be brought and dumped at casualty. In uh, very many ambulances, it used to be the occurrence six in the evening up to about midnight. You have ambulances, coming all the way from all corners of the country. As far as uh, uh, sometimes uh, Makindu, I'm not mentioning places because of anything else other than the distance. And then you find that once they arrived there, the people found in Kashot at that time, were they prepared for this number of people? And we ended up uh, formulating what we are calling the national referral uh, guidelines and policy which were allowed in 2014, but up to today, they have never been utilized. We look at the ambulance level of accessing. How do you access an ambulance? How do you manage ambulances? So, so, so it has a lot, it needs a lot of conversation. It needs a lot of people sitting down and talking seriously on health, not as politicians, but as the provision. And the government needs to tell us with 4% with of the national budget, what else can the citizen do? How can citizens be able to own their health? I, I was surprised yesterday when we, one of the governors was saying that they are going to close hospitals because they don't have money to run hospitals. When he was asked how much he receives, he says 5% is what he collects. And when I look at the genesis of uh, the way we wanted to devolve. Counties were supposed to generate their funding so that they can be able to run health among many other issues. So there's somewhere we lost it completely. So even when we are devolved, we are still thinking of the central government and with 4%, 60 billion, there's nothing you can be able to do other than maybe scratch, but you cannot be able to do what we are calling universal health coverage with that amount of money. Other people need to be involved. The private sector, the citizens themselves needs to be involved in uh, taking care of health. So as far as now the question of equitability is concerned, it, it takes more than just saying that we are going to give Look at the car conversation, talk about the side, everything aside, and citizens sit and say, 
if we wanted healthcare, what do we need to do? How much do we need to contribute? One, those who are not employed, they can uh, contribute their manpower services. Those who are more than the others can be able to. But it is a conversation that we seriously need to have if we are going to be able to fund our universal health uh, coverage. It, it should not just be a slogan. It, it has to be something that can be actioned. True, thank you. And then to, to maybe one last question, our time is really much gone. Uh, this is from Dr. Caesar Bita, who is in Kisumu, and he says that uh, with the UHC in Kisumu, they noted a significant reduction in complementary NHIF enrollment, which would have availed better care for the patient and, al and allowed more resources in public hospitals. Is there a balance that can be achieved between these two? Uh, and the first, uh, let's talk of uh, healthcare financing. It is a very big topic, which uh, if we started discussing today, it went uh, 2030 and beyond. Mm -hmm. But one of the disadvantages we realized with the, the piloted areas is that when people feel they are being piloted, they take that as free treatment. The government is taking over our treatment. What we used to have during independence up to about 1970 something, you could walk into a health center, into a hospital, be treated, get medicine, and even get for other people and get for tomorrow. Now, people have been thinking that universal health coverage is equal to free. And therefore, most people stopped enrolling with NHIF because they think once they go there, they are going to get their money. Now, again, is another conversation. If we needed uh, universal health coverage, and this has happened in Rwanda, I, I nobody go there for teaching and doing a bit of uh, work with the, Rwandese univers the Rwanda University, is that everybody contributes something towards an insurance. If you don't, there's nowhere else you're going to get money to be able to be treated. They, 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 we don't have a basket where there is money kept for health. 60 billion, I'm telling you, cannot treat anybody. And if you find all the other services, immunization is funded from outside. HIV is funded from outside. Uh, COVID was funded from outside. And you can see what we did with COVID money. So, so, so it means this conversation of uh, universal health care has to be tackled in such a way that the citizens we will realize this is our problem. It is not a government problem. This is our problem. And this is what we can be able to do. This is what my rich friend can be able to do. And it will tell you that we are putting malls. We are putting uh, gated community houses, but nobody thinks of putting up a good hospital. It tells you that all of us don't own health. And the day citizens we own health, we started owning education a bit. We know that you cannot go. We own our food. Nowadays, you cannot just go to a supermarket, pick food, and go home. But I'll tell you, somebody, you go to a hospital, get uh, metals inserted, and want to get out of the hospital without paying a coin. Is it because they don't have money, or is it because of the understanding that health belongs to the government, and, I'm a, and therefore I have no responsibility? So Kisum was one of the areas that was piloted. And I think the information that went to the citizens is that the pilot means free. Just come, be treated, and therefore you don't have even to join NHIF. The message should have been, can every Kenyan, the 47 million of us, get enrolled in a national insurance? Then from that basket, and I can tell you from a basket, because not all of us are going to be sick, it can be able to take care of our universal health care. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Kabetu. And one last one. This had, was uh, Dr. Mange, I think had been directed to Dr. Mange Bashid. Dr. I've lost you, Nanga. Saying this is uh, about representation of anesthesia and critical care. At the in the ministry. 
Yeah. <laughs> Let me laugh because I remember was when I when we formed KSA. This was 1994, and during our first uh, annual conference and AGM, we had our, our DMS that time who was Professor Meme, and we presented our case and said we need somebody in the ministry. After that, we talked to many people. Who, and uh, one of the things they we used to hear is that if I need anything, I will ask Professor Gomi or Dr. Kabetu. <laughs> and it died there. We called a stakeholders meeting around 2015 there. We had a representation from the Ministry of Health. We still put across that we need an office because anesthesia, if you are going to make it into a national, if you are going to have it as part of the national surgery, obstetrics, trauma, and anesthesia, it cannot be handled by, I'm told nowadays we are handled by a special, is it a, a special uh, person who deals with uh, some services and critical care is one of them and anesthesia is one of them, but it's not an anesthetist. We have, uh, and I think the way forward, because I want to, to put it to us as an anesthetist, is we have to start thinking of anesthesia. First of all, look at our training in undergraduate. Look at it. How do we induct, how do we spread our anesthesia to the undergraduate so that they can get interested in anesthesia? When we are doing internship, we have been pushing for this. I hope one day it will happen so that we can have a rotation in anesthesia, interns rotating in the department of anesthesia and critical care. The same way they rotate in obstetrics, the same way they rotate in pediatrics, the same way they rotate in, so that by the time they are finishing, they are being signed off. They have an idea of what anesthesia is, they can be able to prepare patients and they can work in ICU. Then, once they are registered by the medical practitioners and dentist council, can one of the rotations be anesthesia and critical care so that they are working there as medical officers. Then from there, they can be able to work with guys who are giving, uh, doing cesarean sections. Most of the cesarean sections in the country, and this is a study that uh, Professor Gomi contributed to, are done by medical officers in the level three, level four, and some level five hospitals. Can't we have the same anesthesia medical officers and this has worked in South Africa, whereby we have uh, medical officers in, uh, in the periphery who actually have done a membership exam because they are being taught how to give safe anesthesia, but limited the same way we limit the medical officers in what they can be able to do. Uh, once it gets there, somebody somewhere in the ministry will also see that there is an important group of people called anesthetists who are up from medical students to me interns to medical officers. And most likely that day you get a slot and you can get, get a division of anesthesia. It's a political decision again. Uh, you cannot take yourself because I remember one time you are told, give me a name and I will appoint. You don't want to be appointed by giving a name. You want a structure. And I hope now again, the team that has come in led by Dr. Okero, Dr. Naburido, please, can we still continue hammering this? One day we will be listened to. And one of the encouraging messages I've gotten from Dr. Mwangangi is that she is willing to see how we can be able to expound on this uh, and then see how we can be able to work on these collaborations. So I'm hoping after this meeting, there, there could be another meeting whereby anesthetists are invited by Dr. Mwangagi and we can be able to go and push more of the activities of Operation Smile. I mean, not Operation Smile, but anesthesia using the model of Operation Smile. I think the only time we have had a serious discussion in the ministry is when we had been summoned because of somebody who wanted to train ketamine providers. And we found ourselves there with Professor Gomi, Dr. I, Jacqueline uh, Athoga and I think uh, some other person and we were able actually to articulate. After that, I don't think any of us have been involved in the policy making of anesthesia, which is a very important 
a component of healthcare and universal healthcare in the country. Thank you for that uh, response. I think uh, uh, I don't have any more questions. Uh, I hope Dr. Okello is taking all that into his entry. I think the work is clearly cut out for, for the current uh, executive committee. Uh, thanks a lot. At this point, I would like to thank all that have participated to make this webinar a success. Uh, from Dr. Kabetu, the main presenter, uh, Pharma Specialities for partnering with us, KSC for hosting us, and all the participants for uh, making it uh, possible to, to take part in this webinar. Asante sana. Let's meet again next uh, Thursday for our weekly webinar. Good night and goodbye.